There's a major question facing enterprise companies these days. How do we upgrade our infrastructure so we're equipped to get the most from artificial intelligence? I'm James McGuire, this is Tech Voices, and I'm discussing modernizing infrastructure with a top expert in the IT sector, Madhu Rangarajan, Corporate VP of Server Products at AMD. Madhu, really good to have you with us today. All right, nice to speak speaking to you today, thank you. All right, so I, I think companies are pretty confused these days in terms of AI adoption. I think as, mm -hmm. as businesses work to scale their AI deployment, many of them are really scrambling to build the necessary infrastructure. I mean, what sort of challenges are they running into? I, I know you talk with a lot of clients. What, what do you hear from people? So I think the first question is, okay, where do you start? Right. right. And uh, how do I deploy this complex AI infrastructure? Uh, how do I get a software stack that just works? What should I use when? When should I use a CPU? When should I be using a GPU? I think there are a whole lot of questions in everyone's mind uh, right. on what kind of infrastructure should they deploy and how can they actually deploy the infrastructure, especially with the uh, specialization and the power and all of the cooling needs that come with it. I, I always feel sorry for people because there are so many questions and, and, and who do you turn to to answer all those questions? But, but please go ahead. Yeah, and at least the way I look at it, right? AMD has a full solution of uh, and an AI portfolio, CPUs, GPUs. Uh, we have AI PCs. Uh, we got networking like the AI mix from our Pensander team. We acquired ZT systems to do full rack level solutions. We are, we continue to improve upon the Rockem software stack to make it much more easy to use. We acquired Silo AI as an enterprise AI software stack. So all of these pieces, we are bringing them together to make this easier. And we're also helping customers answer the question, hey, how do you begin your journey with AI, right? When should you use Epic CPUs? When should you be using Instinct GPUs? Uh, how do you get your data center ready for AI in the first place? And so on. So we can dive into any of those as yeah, I think that, that one question you brought up, I think is on a lot of people's minds, and I know probably the full answer is probably a 90 minute answer. But if, if you talk about that, the CPU GPU question, yeah. is there a way to sort of give a, a high level answer to those or, or some of that question? Yeah, I think the way I look at it is I look at these three different pillars and how I'm an epic CPU guy. So I'll kind of give you a CPU. Uh, and, and please give me a little background, if you would, on what, what do you mean by the epic CPU? Okay, so the AMD Epic CPU is the server class CPU that's now being broadly used across data centers. Um, we are approaching 41% market share now. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, if you look at the a lot of the biggest hyperscalers in the world, a lot of the services that you probably use every single day, they are running on Epic CPUs in the background. Yep. And in terms of AI, right, there are CPUs and then there are GPUs. And what do you use when? Uh, to me, the first step in a journey towards AI is, you know what, you need to get your data center ready for AI. And that means having the space and power and cooling and all of that needed to deploy AI infrastructure. So, and that's where I think Epic CPUs are super helpful because they deliver on performance and they deliver on efficiency. So if you consider a lot of enterprise data centers that have five-year-old servers, if they modernize their infrastructure to the latest generation Epic, you can fit, get the same amount of general purpose workload that you were doing in 70% less space, 70% less power. Uh -huh. Now you can figure out, okay, what do I want to do with that 70%? And you can deploy more infrastructure, whether it's CPU infrastructure or GPU infrastructure, depending on what kind of AI workloads you're running. Mm -hmm. That's well, kind of the first step. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, don't meet her up, please. Uh, all right. Step two is, okay, now I, I made up, the, I, I created some space and power for more infrastructure. Now, what do I do? And this is where the type of model and the scale at which you're running in make a huge difference. So if you're doing gradient boost algorithms or XG boost or more classical machine learning, uh, the CPUs do really well on that. And uh, Epic CPUs in general, you'll see and performance benefits uh, with Epic CPUs over competition and many workloads like Similarity Search and X. Now, if you're running LLMs, or maybe let me start with small language models, and right. you're running it at small scale. So for example, let's say you have an enterprise chatbot that's occasionally serving queries. 
those run perfectly fine on the CPU. And we got, uh, uh, we are supporting all of the open source stacks out there. We got Zen DNN, which is a plugin to Python, which can be used to PyTorch, which mm -hmm. can be used to get performance out of the Epic CPUs and so on. Right. But then you deploy AI at scale, you are serving large language models at scale. You're really doing generative AI at scale. Mm -hmm. And that's when you really need the CPU plus GPU working infrastructure that AMD is delivering. And at that point, you might wonder, hey, does the CPU still matter or is this a GPU workload? And the answer surprisingly is the CPU actually matters a lot hmm. because even though it's a GPU workload, there's some pre-processing work and kernel launch work and things like that that happen on the CPU. And so there's a CPU bound portion, there's a GPU bound portion. And the goal for us from a CPU perspective is when you're running those GPU heavy workloads, make that CPU bound portion as small as possible so you can increase the utilization on your GPU and get more performance out of it. And we did exactly that with the uh, fifth generation Epic where we launched a five gigahertz 64 core CPU. Mm -hmm. And what that does is exactly that. Whenever you have these kernel launches and phases during which you want to execute quickly and get out of the way, we boost the clock up to five gigahertz, execute it really quickly. And what that translates into real world performance is anywhere from 10 to 20% on a GPU box. Uh -huh. And just quick back of the envelope stuff, that's 10 to 20% out of a two socket server with eight GPUs, which may cost, let's say a couple of hundred K. Right. And if you look at that in a per, per dollar perspective, that's I don't know, 30, 40 K per, per dollar just by using the right CPU to power your GPU infrastructure. Hmm. So, that's kind of how we look at this AI journey for the AI workload itself, right. and not to mention the supporting workloads, right? Um, the RAG, the pre-processing, post-processing, uh, kind of Spark ETL kind of workloads to extract stuff. And so things like that, they are also, they run really well in the CPU, and we're seeing a lot of demand for the CPU for workloads like that. And the only other thing I'd mention is agentic AI also changes everything. The way I look at it is, in the past, you had millions of users accessing CPU, GPU, and networking resources directly to do a lot of work. Okay. And now you're going to have millions of users accessing tens of millions of agents. Right. All of those agents accessing compute at speeds that are unheard of. Right. So right. what I think is going to happen is almost an insatiable design, a desire for all kinds of compute, CPU, GPU, networking in the future. Yeah, that, I, I do wonder how we're going to keep up with all that, the, especially the agentic AI. Uh, yeah. I, actually, it's good. Okay, I'm glad we sort of burling into this part of this topic and that I think it's a, I've heard it from some people. I think it, maybe it's an uninf uninformed opinion, but there's a sense of like, well, oh, if you're doing AI, you're, you're running on a GPU, you can't run seriously AI, AI on a CPU. But that, that is a completely uninformed opinion. Agree, disagree? Uh, yes, I think that is. It's maybe it's specific kinds of AI, sure. Right? Okay. You're running generative AI at scale. I'd say, yes, you want a GPU, a really good CPU. But if you're running more traditional models, if you're running uh, smaller language models at smaller scale, there are lots of usages, especially in enterprise, where I think CPUs uh, fit the bill for many use cases. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's talk about the idea of open systems as opposed to proprietary systems. I mean, many systems in enterprise IT are proprietary. It seems like it's a dominant model, but then open may be emerging or open has a big chunk of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Some companies for sure are, are seeking to use open systems to avoid vendor lock-in and provide greater flexibility. Yeah. What, what's your sense of the idea of, of, of open systems? I guess there's openness at a couple of levels, right? There is the solution that the enterprise customer gets with which may be built out of a set of proprietary things, or it could also be built out of a set of open things put together and delivered to a customer as a vertical solution. Uh, I think the way we are looking at it at AMD is, look, we want to put together the CPU with the GPU, with the networking, with the software stack in an open model, which is mm -hmm. why we pioneered get that whole ultra ethernet consortium and the UA link consortium right. as an alternative to some of the more proprietary things out there. What we want to enable, we think AI is much, much bigger than any one company can uh, innovate at the rate of so it, it requires yes. an entire community of companies to be innovating, to really innovate rapidly. 
-hmm. which is why I think it is critical for, to be able to put together all of these different pieces with open standards and put together solutions. Now, uh, that doesn't mean the end customer would now have to figure out, oh, I'm going to, do I have to pick uh, box one plus box two plus box three and what right. combination should I use? Right. I think there'll be a whole set of companies that can put together solutions, but those companies that are putting together solutions will have an option of, of mixing and matching the right things for their end customers. Mm -hmm. So that's how I think about the openness is uh, giving the customer a choice. And even if the customer doesn't want a choice and wants something more integrated, it gives the integrator a choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you see a kind of, if you zoom out from the whole idea, do you see a, a world in which proprietary systems are fading away and open systems are emerging or not necessarily? They're going to be balanced as we go forward. I think anything brand new and shiny tends to start off proprietary. Mm -hmm. And then it tends to start opening up as it starts being adopted more broadly. Right. And I think that's exactly what we are seeing in AI. I think it's very similar to other technologies of the past, the mainframe giving uh, way to more standard x86 servers, uh, AI supercomputers built uh, vertically giving, uh, making way for AI supercomputers built with standards-based components and interfaces. So mm -hmm. I think it's a natural evolution of things. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I think you've talked a bit about AMD's role in, in scaling infrastructure. Um, anything else that's really worth adding in terms of how AMD supports businesses as they work to scale out their AI infrastructure? What, what really matters here? I think what really matters is, well, we got all of the different pieces, mm -hmm. CPUs, GPUs, networking. We got the ability to put them together in racks and uh, we, we're growing the software stack to put it all together. So I think what I'd say is we have all of the pieces necessary to work with all of our partners effectively to deliver value to our end customer. Mm -hmm. And the other piece of this is the execution itself, right? If you look at, we have five generations of Epic CPUs. I think uh, we went from 2% market share to 41%. Uh -huh. uh, oh, over, what, over what time frame was that? Over 2018 to now. Ah, okay, great. Yeah, and that's over five generations of Zen CPUs. Mm -hmm. um, during that time, our performance went up about 11x. Uh -huh. Our efficiency went up about 4x. And that's why we are very quickly gaining. I think we will soon be the largest CPU vendor, I'm sure. Fingers okay. crossed. All right. uh, and we are looking to replicate the same on the GPU. Uh -huh. that, that is that is an ambitious goal to be sure. Uh, so you're looking yeah. looking ahead uh, on the topic of looking ahead. What do you see if you look look into your crystal ball, look into the future, the, the near to midterm mm -hmm. future of IT infrastructure, you know, 2026, 27. What, what do you what do you see in terms of scaling out for, for AI in the next couple of years? What's going to be going on? Maybe a milestone or what, what do you say? Um, I think you have a lot of uh, customers now just kind of experimenting with AI. Yeah. But I see that we quickly transitioning to, you now they have got to use AI for productivity. They have sure. got to use AI to uh, actually um, make, uh, to actually deliver uh, many times the value of the investments they put into it, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think I, I see that happening over the next few years. I see enterprises deploying more AI infrastructure integrating more of their the regular services with AI. And I, I see AI as becoming a massive productivity boost over the next two, three mm -hmm. years. Yeah, certainly the, the piece of agentic AI, which you mentioned, it's going to be, you know, as, also, as you mentioned, it's going to be really hard to keep up with all, all that because it's going to really, yeah. it, it's going to really increase the demand. Sometimes I wonder, will we be able to keep up with, with all the demand of it? That's the big question. Yeah, and I think, the, uh, all of us and the silicon uh, business are absolutely looking forward to making sure we can supply all of the uh, components that are needed. Mm -hmm. right? I think uh, at AMD, we have not had an issue with that so far. We have a very close partnership with 3SMC. We have a very close partnership with the ecosystem partners. Mm -hmm. I mean, our server CPU demand was at almost nothing five, six years ago, and now we are shipping millions and millions and millions of CPUs every year. Right. So uh, I think 
we have figured out the, the supply side of, the, the, of how to make sure we can deliver what our customers are asking for. Mm -hmm. And I think on the demand side, it, that's, that's just going to go up. I think it's going to be insatiable with Agentic AI. Mm -hmm. Madhu, I think you said it. Uh, it's a lot of good insight. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. And uh, please come back and talk with us again sometime. Absolutely. Thank you very much.